Hi everyone, Barbara Moore here. Catch your breath, 60. I was diagnosed with COPD <clears throat> back in 2016. I had suffered about eight years with the symptoms of COPD without getting checked out. Um, so for the last three years, I've been on a learning curve of trying to manage my disease. Hi Merlin, how are you today? Um, trying to let manage my disease figure out the triggers and the trackers and everything that um, could compromise my system. Last week we talked about social media and the ins and outs of it. Hi Carol, welcome today. I'm so glad you joined us. We missed you last week or the week before it was. Um, so we talked to you last week about social media and hi Don and how it makes us feel good and bad and we kind of discussed this out last week and a couple of people had said that it was time to um, move from some of the support networks. I have never received a, a negative comment on any social networks, so social media networks um, concerning COPD or anything else. Hi Joanne, thanks for joining us today. Um, but uh, some people have and I don't, I don't, uh, I can't condone any um, negative comments. We are all suffering from COPD or other chronic illnesses. And no matter what your chronic illness is, your health is just as important as mine is. And while we're on the topic of, you know, social, um, social uh, media and the influence of social media, you know, I've been thinking the last couple of months you know, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, they go here and they go there and they go other places. And I'm very comfortable in my house. I always have been very, very, very comfortable in my house. And uh, it's almost uh, to the point where um, it's not really natural. Like I could stay in my house all the time. I'd love my house and uh, I make my house nice so that it is nice to be. And I love my office. I work here all day. And going out was never really a thing for me. And as I look back over the years, I realized that. Um, hi, Sherilyn. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, I realized that this is not something that is new to me. This is something that has always been. And I've been looking into, you know, the causes of COPD. And we all know that COPD is caused by smoking. But I think that there's some genetic factors that play in the background there. And I think that if we all look back to um, previous decades in our lives, we will see that not much has actually changed. I was never really, and I wouldn't say that I was a couch potato, but exercising was always very, very hard for me. And we know that that's one of the issues with uh, COPD is that we don't get enough um, oxygen into our lungs. And so exercising is hard. And I think that there's a lot of reasons why we end up the way that we end up. But anyways, the bottom line is here. We are here now. And in an attempt to try and feel normal while you're live while I'm living with um while I'm living with my COPD, I kind of thought that, you know, it would be nice to kind of get out for a little bit, right? Do some different things. Change it up, switch it up a bit. So in the last three in the last month I've had three um, appointments where I've gone out. I've made three social engagements. The first one was to go to the show we went to, and I think I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We went to the show to see Downton Abbey. And it seemed like such a really good idea at the time, right? You know, how hard can it be to get into the show and get out of the show? And, you know, we were gonna go in the afternoon. We went in the afternoon. And how nice would that be? And then we just go see my grandson. Uh, he goes swimming on Wednesday afternoon. So, you know, we went on a Wednesday afternoon, one o'clock. We got to the show. The first thing that um, greeted me when we got to the show was absolutely no disability parking. And the next thing that greeted me was a flight of 24 stairs in order to get up to the show. And I thought, you know what, Silver City, you could do better than this. There's absolutely no reason why things should be this way. And I guess you don't understand when you're not disabled, you can't possibly understand how hard it is for us to get into a place where normal people go. 
We are still normal, even though we have chronic illness, but getting up a flight of 24 stairs was really, really daunting. Once I got up the stairs, I was greeted by the smell of imitation butter, and it just about took my breath away. I could barely breathe. Aside from that was the dirty carpets in the place, and I'm sure that they haven't been cleaned since the place opened in the 70s. The washrooms were inadequate for anybody with a disability. Um, they were overcrowded and there wasn't enough of them. Seating was inadequate for somebody with a disability. So, you know, um, it was really nice to go and see the movie. I really enjoyed the afternoon out. And I think my husband really did too, because he doesn't get to do a whole lot of stuff. He gets stuck with me a lot. And so going to the show was something that we haven't done. I think the last show that we saw before this was uh, the Titanic. That's how long ago it's been since we've been to the show. It was never something that I enjoyed doing going to the show. I always thought that they were dirty places anyways. But now I can, um, I can uh, uh, reiterate this, that, you know, the place is dirty. It's filthy. People have been there. And when we got there, you know, the place was absolutely packed. And all I could think about, you know, was the flu and the cold and everything that's going around. And all it's going to take is one person to sneeze. So we, I went to the show and I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed going to the show and that, but um, not something that I'm going to do again. So I've actually crossed that off of my list. And my advice to you would be, if you're going to someplace that's, you know, um, public like that, check it out first. Think about it. Get a, uh, get a, a, a map of the layout of the land. Um, so that you can see if it really does work for you. And it was really tough for me um, to get in and out. And as much as I enjoyed the show, I would much rather have watched it from my kitchen, uh, from my, my own TV. Then I went with an old girlfriend for lunch. And uh, I worked with this girl for about 15 years before. And I really, really enjoyed her company. And we have a good time. We always had a good time when we worked together. The thing was, is that we never really socialized outside of work. And so, um, you know, meeting her for lunch was something just a little bit different, right? And I was kind of looking for, you know, just a light breezy lunch. But this, of course, was the first time that she had seen me since I had become ill. Certainly since I had started wearing oxygen. It was really, really hard. I had nobody to take care of me. I was totally on my own. My husband wasn't there. I had no caregivers with me and that's not something that's a normal situation for me anymore because I don't drive. So um, I usually have to be taken, you know. Um, the place was very, very crowded. The scents and the smells would just kill you. So for somebody like me with COPD or um, any chronic illness like this, if the scents and the smells really bother you, you've got to be really, really careful, right? My own fault and I've learned, I'm learning. So. <clears throat> going to the show is probably something that I'm not going to do anymore. Um, and going for lunch with friends is probably not something I'm going to be doing anymore either because um, unless I can have an advocate or a caregiver there, somebody to help me with, uh, uh, with uh, whatever I need. So we went to this place and we decided to, uh, you know, I, we, I didn't check it out first, right? The bathrooms were downstairs. And it was an all-you-could-eat buffet where you had to go and get your own. So it was really tough for me, carrying my oxygen and everything, right, to get my lunch. So it was very, very uncomfortable. And the other thing is, you know, conversations with people that you used to work with 15 years ago, it doesn't quite work in today's, in today's, you know, atmosphere. We're not on the same plane at all. So it was a very awkward situation. So finally, uh, we were invited to a family wedding, and it was very gracious. It was a lovely wedding. It was in the country, and uh, the country that I'm aware of, and I know this country, and I, you know, it's, you know, it's uh, probably an hour and a half from the city. And we've been there before, and we've, you know, we've been out there many, many times, but I have not been out there since I was sick. So we went to the wedding, and it was lovely. The bride and groom were gracious. The bride was absolutely gorgeous. Um, I got into the church after, once again, not realizing that there were stairs involved. And um, there was probably about six concrete stairs to get up, which wasn't too bad, but I have my walker with me and my oxygen. And uh, I got into the church and it was full of incense. And of course, I started to gag and to cough and to 
you know, and so I had to turn around and walk out. And so and the, the ushers just got me at the church and they had to turn around and take me right out again. So I had to sit in the car because it was a very small church, very small, very quaint, and uh, it was a lovely ceremony. But I couldn't take the incense inside the church. You know, something that I hadn't really thought about ahead of time is that when you go to the country on a nice, clear fall day, farmers burn their garbage. And as I was sitting in the car waiting for the uh, wedding to be over and everybody to come out, um, all around me were wildfires. And I don't, I don't, um, we live in the city, so we don't catch the fires like, you know, in the sense like you guys do. And so, um, um, All around me, people were burning their garbage, right? Because that's what you do in the country. Everybody burns their garbage. Beautiful Sunday, Saturday afternoon. And um, the place, it was just full of it, right? So there's absolutely no way of getting away from it. Um, there was no washrooms, no adequate washrooms that were within wheelchair distance. So these were things that I should have checked out. Um, and going to a place like a wedding in the fall... Uh, with the flu and colds that are going around now was pretty was pretty uh, brave of me, right? Because all it takes is one person to sneeze or cough, right? So, you know, things that you don't think of and things that you can't control. Um, the incense in the church. I remember having incense all the time. I used to have incense in my house all the time, always all over the place. And I never, ever, ever thought of it bothering anybody. Um... Everybody wears perfume. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for joining us today. Everybody wears perfume, and the men double up on the aftershave when they're going out for a social engagement. And there's very little you can do about getting away from it. So no matter where you're sitting, you're sitting beside somebody, behind somebody, in front of somebody uh, who has dosed themselves in perfume. And I didn't realize that people still wear perfume. I thought everybody knew not to do that. But um, I guess, you know, it's you go to a wedding, that's the first thing that you do, right? You put on a bunch of perfume. And we don't think about it, right? Um, when you are uh, a guest at the wedding and you are not being accommodated, the you're usually sitting too far away from the washrooms and too far away from the um, front door, right? Yes, Amy says that her grandson uh, was married back in um, uh, June and she was unable to attend because of too many stairs and uneven ground. And I can't go into unfamiliar territory. And I think that's what I'm trying to say exactly that, Amy. We hadn't been uh, to anything like a family wedding. We hadn't had anything like that for a while. And so this would be my first outing to a, a, a wedding or anything that... Um, uh, would take, you know, all day. And so, you know, you don't think about these things. Driving to the venue, the highway pollution, and you can't, there's nothing you can do about the uh, tractors and the trailers and the trucks and everything that are on the highway, right? So you're going through some highway pollution. And we were probably two and a half hours on the road getting there, two and a half hours back. So that was five hours of highway pollution let alone anything else. Um, people were very, very close to each other. Um, you know, they, we try to, everybody tries to get as many people in as they, as they can, but people are sitting far too close to each other. And uh, it only takes one person to sneeze, one server to not wash their hand, one, um, uh, you know, chef to taste the sauce and put the spoon back in, right? So, these are things that I have learned, and I learned this um, the hard way over the weekend. Um, I went to the wedding because I didn't want to be the downer, and I didn't want to, you know, I was tired of saying, no, I'm not going, I'm not going to attend, I'm not going to do these things. And so I've learned the hard way that um, just because there's a family wedding, it doesn't mean that you have to go. And it's okay for you to say no. And it's funny because my daughter sat me down the night before, and she said, 
If you decide tomorrow when you wake up that you don't want to go to the wedding, you don't have to go. And I thought, well, you know, that's nice because it's nice to have permission, right? It's very hard for us to give ourselves permission. Um, but, you know, my, I know my husband wanted to go and he, I know he wanted me to go. And I had um, told him a couple of times, you know, I'll stay home. You just go and you go ahead and have, have fun. Um, but we need to start being our own advocates. We need to start saying... I am not willing to do this because, or I am willing to do this under these circumstances. And it was up to me to check in advance before I sent the um, confirmation through that my husband and I would be going. It was up to us to go and check out the venue and make sure that um, washrooms were adequate and that uh, there wasn't too many stairs, right? So if you're not willing to do this for yourself um, and... Uh, nobody is willing to do it for you, then you're going to be in a little bit of trouble, right? Because you get into these situations and there's not much you can do except carry it through to the end. You can't just stop. Um, you can't just stop halfway through and say, well, I'm going to give up because you've either got to go or you've got to go home. And Carol, I agree. And I think this was this is what one of the problems was that my immediate family wasn't with me. And this was one of the first uh, times that my husband and I had been out for a while that my family haven't been around me, right? And my immediate family is very, very accommodating. Um, but people who are a little bit further distance, they don't understand what accommodations you need. And if you don't tell them, it's impossible for them to know. They can't actually know. You know, people see me walking around with the cannulas in my nose and they think, oh, well, she can breathe just fine because she's got oxygen, Right. Uh, it's not exactly true, right? Because, you know, I'm huffing and puffing all the time and um, I can't catch my breath even though I've got the cannulas in my um, in my nose. So here's, here's my message today. We need to advocate for ourselves. We need to be able to speak up and say, um, no, I don't think that I'll be comfortable in that situation. And what I find is, you know, Carol, when when, you know, last year I used to have a lot of anxiety about going out and I didn't want to go out and I was always afraid of what was going to happen when I went out. And I think that was because I was going the wrong places. If I know where I'm going and I know what it looks like and I know where the washrooms are and I know the people who are going to be there and I know what to expect when I get there, it's all completely different. But these three um, outings that I had this this month going to the show and going for lunch with a friend and going to a family wedding were all situations where I was not prepared for what had happened and that made it very, very stressful. What I will say though, it was an absolutely beautiful day to be out. Saturday here was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the temperatures were perfect. The There was no humidity. It was absolutely great. And I did make it there and back without having any issues or, you know, um, any anxiety, I was absolutely fine with it. My husband, of course, was with me, and so he was a doll, you know. Anybody who knows my husband knows that he is. So, you know, I think that in the future, social media or not, and I'm really, really happy to hear where you guys go, all the things that you do, all the places that you've been, all the, the uh, walks that you go on and everything. But we have to be able to say for ourselves what is good and what is not good. So in the future, I'm really going to start learning this. Um, I've learned a really, really, really hard lesson the last, uh, the last couple of weeks with my outings. And I think that um, uh, you know, people should not be holding it against you if you decline in, in uh, invitations. Um, it's not always easy for everybody, right, to get to where you are and to do the things that you do. And people don't understand that two or three steps can really make a difference, right? So I think that's my story for this week. Um, remember that we have to be our own advocate. It's okay to speak on your own behalf. Um, my daughter taught me how to do it and I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely graciously so thankful for her um, because she taught me how to do it and she taught me how to do it properly, right? So I've been having you know, a, a little bit of issue with some water retention, and I'm still fighting this water retention. I, I finally gotten to the point where I have to be really proactive and stop drinking water, which is really hard for me, because um, I could drink about 100 ounces a day, and uh, they've restricted me to 50. So it's, you know, 
I'm always thirsty. But anyways, I'm going to start being proactive about that as well. Um, because the less water I'm retaining, the, the better I can breathe. And that's really, it really, really, really affects my breathing when I'm starting to retain water. My buddy had his transplant last week and he's doing absolutely fabulous. I talked to him on the weekend and he's uh, um, a couple of days out of ICU and a couple of days in the step down ward. Now he'll go to the uh, ward for a couple of weeks and then he'll be, he'll probably be out in, in no time, you know. Um, so I don't know if anybody has thought about this. Has anybody thought about uh, getting on the transplant list and has anybody looked into the... Uh... Yes, Carol, that's actually what I did at the wedding, right? So instead of drinking water, because I know as soon as I start drinking water, I've got to go to the bathroom and the bathrooms were, were just a little bit too far away and just a little bit too... anyways. Um, so what I did was I, I got uh, ice chips and ice chips are a fabulous, fabulous substitute for water, right? For one thing, it takes you a lot longer to get it down than it does water, right? Because you know water, I can just drink it back. Um, but the ice chips are absolutely fabulous. And so my husband went and got me a bag of ice chips the next day. Isn't he a sweetheart? And um, uh, they, they do quench your thirst with less uh, fluid. And another thing that you can do if you are very, very thirsty and on a water restricted, uh, get those grapes, some seedless grapes, put them in the freezer and freeze them. And I'm telling you, when you take those out a couple hours later, they will be just like popping candy into your mouth, way better than chocolate. So I get a mix of, um, you know, the purple grapes and the green grapes, right? So I can have those as my kind of afternoon treat instead of any sweets or, you know, because carbohydrates are not good for us. And carbohydrates will actually, you know, make our stomachs really gassy and bloated, so it's not good for us, right? So how is everybody else doing? Yes, that's it. It, it quenches your thirst with less, uh, with less fluid. And um, I don't know if everybody has this. Does everybody have this problem with fluid? For you, Sherilyn. You know, I've never gone into a, into a store. Has anybody anybody else gone into a store and used one of their motorized carts? I've never done that yet, but I've I've actually been thinking about it. Eh? I saw somebody using one the other day, and I thought, Hey, the hell am I doing walking around the store when she's in a motorized cart? So I said to my husband, You know, that's what's going to happen. Like within you know the next couple of years, that's what's going to happen. So uh, yeah, I haven't actually done that. I'm not sure if I could. Um, drive one of those motorized carts, but I, you know, I used to drive, so I probably could, right? Oh, oh, everybody does it. Oh my God. And I'm the only one, and I'm dragging myself around the store with this stupid bloody oxygen tank. I'm telling you, I don't understand why those tanks have to be so heavy. I just don't get it. <coughs> yeah, that's where actually I was, Carol. I was doing groceries at Walmart. And uh, I thought, oh, look, there's this lady with this motorized cart. Where did she get that from? Good for you, Joanna. She's got a mobilized cart. So they, they talked to me about this in the hospital, you know, a little while ago. And I've actually seen them on Marketplace, on Facebook Marketplace. I've seen a couple, right? Yeah, Sherilyn, that's really that's a really tough place to be. I can't imagine what would happen if I was on my own without anybody to help me. Uh, life would be a lot slower, I can tell you that right now. But uh, love the scooters, eh? So has anybody thought about the uh, getting the valves or uh, going on a transplant list? Anybody, anybody, anybody? You know, we... I bet it is, Joanne. The uh, Joanne says to get one. It's a game changer. I bet it is. Um, we've all been talking about the Zephyr valves. Has anybody thought about them? Oh, Carol, that sounds wonderful. Carol says that she goes in wheelchair chair accessible trails and spends some afternoon in nature. Uh, being an afternoon in nature would be so mindful. Eh? I, I can't even imagine. I haven't been out so much. So what happened, Carol? You talked to the transplant doctors.
Yeah, Joanna, I don't know. The doc, I, I asked the doctor one time when I first got sick about um, getting a transplant. Oh, uh, you have to lose 60 pounds and you're a candidate, eh, Carol? That's motivation to lose 60 pounds, boy. Um, a friend of mine lost her sense of taste and she told me she lost 70 pounds. I was like, is that what it takes, eh? Probably, unfortunately, I guess. Carol, why did you decide against the transplant? Yeah, I, guess, I think we, we probably all need to lose a little bit of weight first. You know, a lot of the weight that we have on us is from the uh, puffers, right? Um, from the steroid in the puffers. Hi, Sharon Thibodeau. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we, uh, we gain so much weight from not being as active as we should be, and uh, from the puffers. You know you know, a lot of it is from the puffers, right? My doctor told me that by the time I qualified for a transplant, by the time my lungs got bad enough for a transplant, that I'd be too old too. Um, yeah, sometimes I think that, Carol, I wonder about that. Um, I have a couple of friends who have had transplants, and... Uh, it's not all clear sailing after. Sometimes it can be, but it's not always, right? So we, you have to watch that, right? I, I admire people who... Hmm. I wonder why. Is anybody having a problem seeing me in the middle of the screen? Um, yeah, I wonder that about transplant, right? Like what, what happens after and you have to be on so many meds and um, some conditions are not are not good after. And I know that there's some people that just sail through it, but other people don't. Um, you know, I think in the end, I think in the end that we all choose life and whatever we'd have to do to choose life, that's what we're going to do. Um, but I'm not so sure that I'm kind of thinking about a transplant. Although I, I give kudos to anybody who has the guts to do it, right? Because I think it really does take a lot of guts. Um, but uh, anyways, I'm happy for my buddy. He's gone through it and uh, he'll be back in no time. It is October 22nd and we are losing on average three to four minutes of daylight per day. Has anybody noticed that? Anyways, in Southern Ontario, we are anyways. I don't know where everybody's from, but... Um, yeah, so we're losing three to four minutes um, of daylight a day. And this is really, this is this is the time of year that it really bug, bugs me. I really, really get depressed. I always, always did. And I used to, when I was working, I used to get really bad headaches around this time of the year when the um, ceilings were lower and the days were darker for longer. You know, I used to get really bad headaches. Don't know what that's about, but I think it had something to do with my oxygen. To tell you the truth, I really think now, looking back, knowing what I know now, I think that um, I was sick for a lot longer than what I realized, and a lot of what a lot of the symptoms that I had in that were from my uh, um, oxygen. I think my oxygen got low. I hate it getting dark so early. I absolutely hate it. So this is why we have to have a hobby. We must have a hobby and something to go to, some go to. So I always read, you know, I'm, I'm a reader and I, I like to read. Um, and we talked one time here, uh, we had some uh, free sites where you could get free books and I kind of get free books and I read all the time. Um, but I think I might get into some knitting this year. My problem is that I am a worker and I always, always, always am working. And I'm all, if I'm not working, I'm always looking for work. And because I'm an accountant, I can um, do a lot of work from home, right? So. People come to me and I don't have to go to them. So this is perfect. It's an absolutely perfect job, right? Um, but I need to be busy all the time and that's my problem. So I think I'm going to get some knitting out and maybe have a look at... Um, yeah, keeping busy with anything, right? So I think I'm going to get my uh, knitting out. So I have this... 
I have this piece that I've been knitting and I don't know what it's going to be. It's just a great big square. So um, it might end up being a blanket or something. I don't know, or maybe I'll just take it apart and knit it again for, for, the, uh, um, for the winter. But you know, something to keep your hands busy. So maybe that's what we'll talk about next week when we come back for tea time at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time at Catch Your Breath 60. And we'll talk about your hobbies and what we're going to do for the winter because it is getting darker earlier. And next month, the clocks are going to uh, go back. So we're going to get more dark, right? And so, you know, then the mornings and the afternoons are a little bit different. But what I can guarantee you is that pretty soon it's going to be dark by four o'clock and the nights will be very, very long. So as long as we can get through these, um, these dark, dark nights, remember that we're only 12 weeks away from spring, right? This is Barbara Moore. Thank you everybody for joining me today on Catch Your Breath 60. I appreciate everybody who comments and leaves a, a note to say, hi, how are you? If you can't watch it live, you can always watch it on the replays. It will be posted tomorrow on YouTube and on my website. So my website is catchyourbreath60.com and my blogs are there. I've got tons and tons of blogs there. I am taking a bit of a hiatus from the blogs. Um, but you'll also find me on Instagram at Catch Your Breath 60, Twitter at Catch Your Breath 60, um, YouTube at Catch Your Breath 60, and uh, don't forget my Facebook page at Catch Your Breath 60. And I am only ever a phone call or a text away. If anybody ever needs to text me, please do. That's it for today's tea time. I'll see you next week. Have a great week.